three. Our guest today is uh, Dr. Sanjeev Chopra, uh, one of the greatest healthcare educators today here in Boston and around the world. He has written about uh, more than 10 books, including one with his brother, uh, Deepak Chopra. And uh, also he is a happiness guru. And we are going to talk to him all these topics very briefly. But let us first start with uh, uh, the COVID-19. Sanju, how you are dealing with this? Well, Pedro, it's a great question. You know, I think in this time of consternation and chaos and crisis, some of us are finding some clarity and finding meaning and purpose in our lives. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if we look at what's happening to planet Earth, which has been violated and traumatized, forest fires were burning, it is beginning to heal. So there are children in New Delhi who have never seen a blue sky or the stars at night, and now they're seeing it. I'm told from Amritsar in India, you can see the peaks of the Himalayas. The river Ganges and Yamuna are clean. I'm told the water is drinkable. Yosemite. I, I will not say drinkable, but the water is definitely very clean, yes. <laughs> okay, so very clean. Yeah. And, you know, Yosemite Park has never been so pristine. The animals are coming out a little bewildered. What happened mm -hmm. to all these humans? The other day I was sitting in my back porch uh, two days in a row, and this beautiful golden brown fox appeared. And then it turned and it sort of looked at me, and I thought it was saying, hmm, you humans have finally gotten it right by taking this pause, <laughs> and then it's carried back into the backwoods. Yesterday it came again, this time it didn't even bother to look at me. So there's a message here, just as planet Earth is healing, we, need, we also need to begin to heal. Yeah. Well, I just want to keep you there. Actually, uh, yesterday we wrote an article also about uh, there is a surge of uh, birds and yeah. butterflies in India, which is wow. absolutely amazing that, you know, the how the wildlife, the nature is coming back. Coming so, back. In that, so in that context, I would like to uh, ask you, since you mentioned the healing of the nature is healing itself, Mother Nature is healing. Yeah. Uh, if you can just spend a little bit time more on that, that how... Uh, how the nature has really, you know, I think we can say that, you know, we cannot control nature, nature controls us. True. Yeah. So, you know, I think because of the low carbon footprint and the pollution, nature is thriving. Hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> it, it's really r remarkable. I mean, you can Google images of the Himalayas and you can Google images of Ganges I saw the image of India Gate in Delhi and they showed it before covered with a pall of smoke and smog and now it's pristine and crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And so we need to take a cue. And one of the things I say is that, you know, start your day on the right foot. So when you wake up with or without an alarm, spring out of bed, go sing in the shower, stretch, come down and sip that beautiful, wonderful aromatic coffee. And then go to your study or to your den where you're going to work. And by the way, not in our pajamas. We got to dress properly. So it sets the right mood. It can be work clothes, whatever, something comfortable. And then set your goals. And then next to the goal, have an action plan. Sanjeev, your face is a little bit cutting. So yeah, yes, this is a perfect yeah. position. Yeah, if you can just. Okay, perfect. So, you know, there's nothing like having a routine. So we do need to do that and then we make our goals and we write an action plan next to it. And we need to be very bold and audacious about those goals. Thoreau once said, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now go put the foundations underneath. Michelangelo once said, the greater tragedy for most of us is not that we aim too high and fall short. We aim too low and we reach the mark. So next to the goals, you have to have an action plan. A vision without a plan is a mere hallucination. Mm -hmm. And then when we make our goals, let's say I made six goals this morning and one was uh, be prepared to you know, do the interview with Upendra. Number two, call my friend Paul Rufo and check on how his mother's doing. Number three, connect with my colleague Bob Carruthers, Seattle. Number four, wish so-and-so happy birthday. Number five, 
work for 30 minutes on the chapter for the book you're writing. Now, the first four are easy, and there's a tendency to tick it off and feel you've accomplished a lot, and you never get to the fifth one. So there's a wonderful book by Brian Tracy. It's called Eat That Frog First, which means do the most uncomfortable thing first. So I'm going to write that chapter for 30 minutes. Next thing, maybe I've done 48 minutes. Do the hard things first and the easy ones take care of themselves. Now, Sanjay, I want to stop you here for a second. Sure. Now, yes, it is easy to think and do those things, you know, when the times are normal. Yeah. But during this time when with uh, COVID-19 and everybody is stressed out because of work and social contact and getting out, how do you cope with this? So the first, one of the important things to do in the morning is meditation. Hmm. And, you know, sometimes people ask, what's the difference between meditation and prayer? So in prayer, we're talking to God. In meditation, God is talking to us. So find five, ten minutes to meditate. It will keep you grounded, anchored, take the stress away, and then you will have more clarity, and then you can work on those goals I mentioned. The other important thing is to reach out to friends. You know, our friends are our chosen family. Friend is a gift that you give to yourself. Khalil Gibran said, friendship is a sweet responsibility, never an opportunity. Best-selling author James Rohn said, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So we can meet with friends by Zoom. We can connect with them, right? And we are doing this interview. And do this interview. <laughs> Sure. And, and so that's critical. You know, there's an amazing study. It's the longest standing study on happiness. It's called the Harvard Grant Study, the Harvard Study on Adult Development. It started almost 80 years ago. And they recruited 650, 21-year-olds. 250 went to Harvard. The others were from Dorchester and Roxbury. They followed them every year, detailed questionnaires and physical examinations, then EKG, CRP, cholesterol, functional MRI, home interviews. A cohort of their children are now being followed. Of that original group, as of last year, 19 were alive, age 91. Hmm. What happened to them? So they became lawyers, doctors, engineers, nurses, CEOs. One became our president. John F. Kennedy was in that cohort. And what is the major conclusion of the study? The major conclusion is that loneliness is toxic and that your satisfaction with relationships with your friends at age 50 is a better predictor of health, happiness, and longevity three decades later at age 80. So celebrate everything small or good with your friends, right? Okay. You know how the social fabric, the connectedness is so important in our happiness. So make your goals, be crystal clear, be bold, be audacious, reach out to your friends, talk to them. That is, one of, meditate in the morning, say I love you more often, be courageous. This now, is to be more courageous. Uh, Sanjeev, now talking about happiness, I have one question for you. Yeah. The, you will not find any individual in this whole world who does not want happiness. That is now, correct. Now, what is one if I, if I ask you to point, point out one obstacle, the one obstacle for happiness, what will that be? We're looking in the wrong places for happiness. We think if I get a new job, I get a promotion, I buy a new car, I move into a bigger house, I join a country club, I'll be happy. Yes, you will be happy for a few months. Then it's the same old house, it's the same old car and you get used to it. And this phenomenon is called hedonic adaptation. So we're looking at the wrong places. Happiness is an inside job. I think there are four keys to happiness. Number one, a cadre of good friends. Number two, ability to forgive. If you hold bitterness or rancor in your heart, you can never be happy. It's not easy to forgive. But anyone listening, if you're holding a grudge against a neighbor, a sibling, a parent, a colleague at work, get rid of it. The moment you make that decision, you'll feel this enormous weight come off your shackles. Like, look at Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison. And when he's released, he's asked the question, Mr. Mandela, do you have a resentment against your captors? He said, I have no bitterness, I have no resentment. Resentment is like drinking poison, then hoping it will kill your enemies. So friends, forgiveness. The third thing is doing things for others, being of service, mentoring, nurturing. 
You know, there's this whole concept now of servant leadership. Leaders are there to serve. So friends, forgiveness for others, three S. The fourth one, which I wish everyone did, gratitude. Start a gratitude journal. Once a week as you're thinking of, say on a Sunday evening, as you're reflecting on what's in store for you the next week, reflect on what transpired the last seven days. Write down what you're grateful for. Robert Emmons is considered the father of modern positive psychology. He's written a book called Thanks, and he, t- he talks about his research. They took a large group, randomized them. Half of them, at the end of the evening, write down three random things you did. The other half, write down three things you're grateful for. And the group that wrote, expressed gratitude, six weeks later, their happiness quotient went way up, 25%. So friends, forgiveness for others and gratitude. But happiness is more than the sum total of happy moments. And in order for us to have sustained happiness, we have to find our purpose and live it. And what I'm finding, I've actually, this is remarkable, I didn't sort of plan it, but in the last 10 days, I've reached out to 300,000 people around the country and talking about how to recalibrate life. So how, how you have reached through the conferences or online? Well, or? There's a company called Primed, and I do conferences for them. And they have 220,000 clinicians. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to them. And I, then I had a friend, Frank Domino, who's a professor of family medicine, interview me like you're doing mm-hmm. on how to recalibrate life. There's an organization called Maestro Cares. They build orphanages around the world, 21 orphanages now. And uh, it's, it's by uh, Henry Cardenas, Mark Anthony, the Latin American singer, Elena Sotomayor. They have 60,000 supporters in their network. So I did an interview with Elena, and it's being sent to all 60,000 people. Then I did something in California for an Indian physician, 5,000 people. Then I did one for a Latino group. So an aggregate, 300,000 people. And the message is resonating. And people are saying, you know what? I'm finding clarity. And I always thought I'd write a book or give a TED talk or journal. I'm going to start doing it. So people are doing that. I think the other thing that we really need to focus on are the five regrets people have at the end of their life. And what are they? I should have said I love you more often. I should have traveled more. I should have spent more time with friends. I should have been the bigger person and said, I'm sorry. I should have had the courage to pursue my dreams and aspirations. So we can't travel right now, but we can go to WGBH and watch Rick Steves and travel to Europe vicariously. We can't meet with friends, but we can do Zoom parties with friends. But we can say, I love you more often. We can be the bigger person and say, I'm sorry. And we can have the courage to pursue our dreams and aspirations. None of us should have any of these regrets late in our life on our deathbed. Okay, Sanjeev, one uh, personal question for you. Sure. I know I have heard you many times talk about happiness and I really yeah. enjoy that. Now, Mike, sometimes I do wonder that is there any time in your life that you go through some sort of a, a stress or distress? And uh, if that happens, how do you deal with that? So I've gone through, I've gone through uh, a number of things in my own life. Uh, one of my children, <clears throat> she had an accident. She was hit by a car. She was in the hospital for two months with concussion, with hip fracture. Um, that was very, very traumatic and stressful. Oh, sorry to hear I've, that. I've, I've had two hip operations, bilateral hip. The second time, the second hip, 100 days later, was infected. I had to do a redo. Then I had a pick line through my arm into my heart for six months. And then the ID person at Mass General said, we have three options. We can either stop the antibiotics, we can go on for a year, or you can take antibiotics for life. I said, you're kidding. I'm going to stop. And I stopped and there was no recurrence. So in in essence, I've had three total hips. So I've gone through that. What has helped me the most is my practice of meditation, but also the love of my friends and family. That has grounded me, anchored me, and Help me rejuvenate. I'll tell you a story. I have uh, two granddaughters, Anya and Mira. They're mm-hmm. 13 and 15 now. When I had my third hip operation, they came from New York, stayed with us. So <clears throat> when they're leaving, Mira was then seven years of age. She says, Nana, 
Soon you'll graduate from two crutches to one crutch, then from one crutch to one cane, and then from one cane to 14 golf clubs. <laughs> <laughs> one day I went up after dinner, I was exhausted. I was anemic, profoundly low blood count. And she says, oh, I know, Nana, you take one crutch to go up, two to come down, so I'll bring you other crutch. Crutch is bigger than her. Mm. So she tucks me into bed. Then she says, do you want me to put on those Tibetan healing chants that your friend Adrian sent you? I said, sure, Mira. So she puts them on. She's leaving. Then she comes back. Do you want a hot water bottle? Then she came down, told Amita, Amita put the hot water bottle, the hot water in it. She came carrying it. I mean, talk about that love. I mean, my healing was so fast because of the love of my family and my friends. So in dire times, reach out to your friends. Your true friends will reach out to you. Meditate. Exercise. Exercise is as good as any of the antidepressants in tackling depression. We need to be motivated to do it. And there are techniques to do that. Now, how uh, let's uh Talk a little bit about meditation. What type of meditation you do and how long you do? And so we learned, uh, my brother Deepak and his wife learned transcendental meditation at a center in Cambridge. They came to a house in Newton. We were staying in Newton that time. And Deepak and Rita said, Amita, Sanjeev, we've been doing this for two weeks. It's the most powerful thing we're doing. You should look into it. So Amita, my wife, who's very spiritual, said, okay. She like went the next day. And I said, I'm glad it's working for you. I don't need it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So Amita learned, and I noticed amazing changes in her. She was a busy pediatrician. She'd come home after a long day, meditate for 15 minutes, and it's like, wow, look at the energy in her face. So after about a month, she went for a checking to make sure she was doing it correctly at the Cambridge Center. And I said, I'll drive you. I'm not going in. I'm staying on, on the side street. And soon enough, there was a knock on the window, and it was the TM teacher who had taught my brother. And he said, hello, I'm Ted Weissman. So I said, hi, Ted. I've heard about you. Uh, I didn't know what to say. So I said, give me the introductory lecture on TM. So he sat in the car, and he gave me the lecture. And I said to him, I have three concerns. Number one, I'm in a position at work where I'm the associate chair of medicine. I have to discipline the interns, the brightest interns at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I don't want to become mellow. He said, Sanjeev, you will be more assertive from a silent level. I said, number two, I smoke a pipe and I don't want to give it up. And number three, I'm playing in a tennis tournament. I'm in the finals. Will I win if I love meditation? <laughs> so he said, I'll be back. He runs into the TM Center, comes back with a pamphlet, the TM Program in Athletics, Excellence in Action. And it had testimonials by Willie Stargell, by Olympic diving champion, amazing athlete saying, this is what gave them clarity on the field. So I said, okay, okay, good. But will I win? And he said, I don't know if you'll win, but if you lose, you won't feel that bad. <laughs> so I learned the next day, and it's been almost 40 years now that Amit and I have been practicing meditation. It's a real gift. It's, it's the most powerful thing I've done. Now, I since you... Twice a day, morning, 10, 15 minutes. And much as you enjoy the meditation and feel very calm and blissful, the reason we do it is to accrue the benefits and activity. So you do meditation in the morning, you plunge into activity. Then around 4 or 5 o'clock, you do it again for 10, 15 minutes, plunge into activity. Now, since you mentioned meditation and uh, uh, Deepak, your brother, so I have to ask you, of course, Deepak has played a very important role in, you know, in meditation and all yeah, those sure. books he has written. Uh, how often you talk to him and do you ever talk about uh, the meditation or, or uh, well-being or happiness with him? No, you know, we, we talk at least once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. We're very close. Uh, <clears throat> but we talk about life. We talk about books. We talk about our kids and grandkids. The meditation is a given. We, we, you know, we're doing it, so we don't even bring it up. Uh, once in a while, we'll bring it up. My wife, Amita, is whom you know, trained to become a teacher of TM. She's taught mm -hmm. about 600 people over the last 10 years. And she doesn't charge. If you go to the TM center, they charge. They mm -hmm. quite a bit now. Um, and I told her about three years ago that, you know, Amita, 
I'm so glad you don't charge, but here's what you should do. You should tell everyone you've taught that they should make a donation to a charity of their choosing. Mm -hmm. They don't have to tell you what amount and which charity, but pay it forward. If you give something of immense value for free, then people may not realize the value later on. Now, some of them will say to her, what's your favorite charity? And it might be Akshay Patra, AIF, and then next thing they've written a check and we get a call or a letter from the foundation that so-and-so made a donation. Now, in this time, of course, she can't do that because it's four days, Friday, Saturday mornings or evenings, Friday, sorry, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and Monday and Tuesday evening, an hour and a half each time. But what she's doing it, doing now is she's teaching a 20 minute meditation and she talks about the science, the ancient wisdom, and then leads the group through a five minute breathing technique or a mantra based. And she's taught hundreds of people, a company four times, a group around the country of women. She's taught it at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She's going to be teaching it at Boston Medical Center. So we really need that silence. Sure. Actually, you know, I think one day I'm, I want to interview her about the ancient sure. wisdom and meditation with yeah. her, hopefully in the... Pretty amazing. You know, there are f functional changes in MRI on the brain, on CAT scan, areas that correlate with compassion are thicker. Telomeres, which is a Nobel Prize winning discovery by Elizabeth Blackburn. Telomeres are at the end of our chromosomes. They prevent the chromosomes from sticking and fraying. Shortened telomeres are linked to accelerated aging. We will die eight, 10 years sooner if we have short telomeres. Who has shortened telomeres? Mothers of chronically severely disabled children, stress mm -hmm. day in day out, caregivers of people with Alzheimer's. Who has longer telomeres? People who exercise, people who meditate, and people who drink coffee. And you don't have to be a Tibetan monk and meditate eight hours a day. 15, 20 minutes, twice a day, telomeres start to increase in size. Published. Mm. Elizabeth Blackburn, who was one of the discoverers of telomeres and telomerase, got the 2009 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. This is a landmark discovery. So, okay, Sanjeev, as we come clo uh, uh, closer to the end of the interview, uh, your last word on happiness, on COVID-19, and how to be stress-free. Yeah, so my last word is, we, I mentioned the four things for happiness, friends, forgiveness for others, and gratitude. But happiness is more than the sum total of happy moments. And in order for us to have sustained happiness, we have to find our purpose and live it. And during this time, bonus time, we're getting more and more clarity about what's important, what are the priorities, what really counts. And your purpose is lurking in there, and you'll discover it if you haven't already discovered it. Some of us are happy enough to have discovered it. Mark Twain once famously said, the two most important days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. Each one of us has a singular purpose in life. So I'll, I'll end by saying that this is a time for healing and that Rumi once said, the wound is where the light enters you. Let the light enter us, embrace that light. Let's be grounded. Let's be stronger. Let's be more resilient. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Don't worry. Worry is the interest we pay on things that never come to pass. Stay in the moment. Yesterday was history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Right. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Nice to chat with you as usual. Uh, Lovely. And, and uh, again, we'll, I think I do want to catch up with uh, your wife, Amita, about the ancient wisdom and uh, meditation. Yeah. Sure. Okay. okay. Thank you, Sanjay. All the best. Take okay. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.